Hanoi, September 22nd, 1940, 20 hundred hours. General Maurice Martin, commander of French forces in Indochina, sits in a humid meeting room with a general of the Imperial Japanese Army. They're working under a deadline. For in two hours, Japan will invade. This had started in June, just after France fell, with a demand from Foreign Minister Matsuoka to cease shipments across the border to China and allow Japanese border observers. But as the months dragged on, the ultimatum has increased. Now, Japan wants the border totally closed and to station troops, ships, and warplanes in northern French Indochina. It's egregious, but Martin has little choice. The Japanese 22nd Army is ready to cross the border at 2200 hours. He makes a counteroffer. How about 6,000 Japanese troops, not 25,000? The general agrees. Whew. An hour before the deadline, word goes out that an agreement has been reached. But when the deadline comes, the 22nd Army invades anyway. Thanks so much to Ground News for sponsoring today's historical tale. Japanese diplomats hadn't expected the Indochina operation to go like that. Theoretically, this was supposed to be part of a diplomatic expansion south, one that was to be accomplished amicably through negotiation. After all, Japan was Germany's ally, and Germany now controlled France. I mean, why wouldn't France just let them in? But again, at this point, Japanese diplomats weren't really running the show. Rather, militarists in the cabinet were directing foreign policy now. And even though Foreign Minister Matsuoka, a man who'd led Japan's exit from the League of Nations, was himself a militarist, even he still had limited power. The military considered the civilian foreign ministry unreliable and rarely shared their plans with Matsuoka or his subordinates. I mean, they'd sent a general to negotiate in Hanoi, not an ambassador. Meanwhile, low-level military officers were provoking conflicts again, like launching a needless invasion of French Indochina despite receiving word of a diplomatic solution. And to be clear, we're not talking about a small border skirmish here. We're talking a multi-day undeclared war with tank formations and amphibious assaults. Now, a few months later, the foreign ministry did successfully act as a mediator to end a short war between Thailand and French Indochina. But that didn't really change Japan's image as a military aggressor. And at the White House, Roosevelt most certainly still felt that way. Over that chaotic summer of 1940, he'd been taking all the actions he could, pitching them as defensive in order to avoid backlash from isolationists. In May, he'd stationed the U.S. Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor, where it could credibly threaten Japan should it try to move south, a move the Navy disliked since it split their fleet and kept it far from its home base. He'd also made diplomatic and congressional moves on what would eventually become the Lend-Lease program, which you can watch our video about here, supplying the UK and other not-quite allies with old military equipment. And after the fall of France, he'd pushed a bill through Congress known as the Two Ocean Navy Act, expanding the US Navy fleet size by 75%. Not only would this allow the US to simultaneously fight a war in both the Atlantic and Pacific, the expansion focused on aircraft carriers and naval aviation, modernizing a badly aging fleet. In September, he reinstated the military draft, and he began efforts to harden American defenses in the Philippines and Guam, and transform the civilian airstrips on Midway and Wake Islands into Navy airbases. America would not seek a war, the reasoning went, but given the march of German and Japanese aggression, it needed to be ready to fight one. But after the aggression in Indochina, Roosevelt wanted to directly target the Japanese military. So, he expanded the embargoes of the Export Act to also cover iron and steel scrap, metals crucial for war production. In response, the Japanese ambassador in Washington met with Secretary of State Cordell Hull, calling the metal embargo an unfriendly act. The United States was intervening in diplomatic negotiations between allies, he said, where it simply had no part. Besides, Japan was merely trying to stop illegal weapons shipments to the corrupt nationalist regime in China. But Hull knew that argument was a smokescreen, because a U.S. military program known as MAGIC had secretly broken Japan's new diplomatic cipher, Purple. While the decryptions weren't total, and many of the messages were difficult to understand due to codewords and poor translations, one thing was clear. The moves in Indochina were part of an expansion south. Yet relations did briefly improve. In November, that ambassador was recalled and replaced with the genial Admiral Nomura, who immediately bonded with Roosevelt over their shared interest in naval matters. 
Furthermore, Hull and Nomura got along well, meeting regularly at Hull's apartment, where they could be more candid, and Nomura always kept an even temper, even when the two clashed, believing to his core that a conflict would be bad for both countries. But what Hull and even Nomura didn't realize was exactly how much Roosevelt's attempt at deterrence was in fact driving Japan closer to war with the United States. In Tokyo, military and civilian leaders were terrified over Roosevelt's expansion of naval power. Because this wasn't just the U.S. leaving behind the naval treaties of the 20s and 30s. This meant new American carriers, destroyers, cruisers, and airplanes coming off the production line every year for the next five years. Currently, the U.S. and Japan had roughly equal navies, with Japan having a slight advantage in merchant vessels. But now that America was on a war-producing footing, that might only last a year or two. So an argument started to circulate. If a war was inevitable, why not fight it soon? After all, every day Japan waited, the U.S. Navy was getting larger, and if Roosevelt cut their oil, the opposite would be true. Each day of non-combat operations would mean Japan had less fuel to fight. Japan's attempt to manufacture synthetic oil had failed, and when they made import deals with Mexico, the U.S. leaned on its southern neighbor to get those canceled. Foreign Minister Matsuoka, however, had a solution. Deter U.S. action by signing a tripartite pact with Europe's totalitarian states of Germany and Italy. Nazi diplomat von Ribbentrop had first suggested such a thing as early as 1938. And to Matsuoka, it made immediate sense. Germany was one of the few nations to recognize Japan's Manchurian puppet state. All three wanted to deter the U.S. from joining the war. And by signaling a mutual defense pact, it meant America would need to fight a two-ocean conflict. Germany also pledged that the Pacific would be Japan's sphere of influence, Matsuoka's concept of the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere, the idea that Japan would throw Western colonialists out of Asia and lead the region to prosperity. Though it should be noted, not everyone was on board with a Nazi alliance. In Tokyo, one colleague warned that Hitler was untrustworthy and routinely violated treaties. After all, Hitler had already broken his anti-communist pact with Japan by signing a non-aggression pact with Stalin, and he hadn't even bothered to inform Tokyo in advance. An alliance hadn't helped them in Indochina, after all. And once the pact was signed, Matsuoka had to issue embarrassing statements saying Japan wouldn't be adopting Germany's anti-Semitic policies. But Matsuoka remained committed to the alliance, especially because he believed the Soviets could be enticed to join forming a block of totalitarian nations to challenge the Western democracies. And in 1940, the alliance bore fruit. November 11th, 1940, 250 miles southwest of Sumatra. Officers of the German commerce raider Atlantis board the merchant vessel. They'd come upon it disguised as a fellow merchant ship, then fired at the bridge at close range, killing most of the command. Now they're taking passengers and crew aboard their own ship before scuttling it. But then, one of the passengers asks an officer if they could go get her family's tea set in the ship's vault. And when he agrees and goes to retrieve it, the officer finds more than just porcelain. Fifteen bags of top-secret mail destined for the British Far East Command. There are maps, decoders, intelligence reports, and a special bag filled with holes so it would sink when thrown overboard. Documents inside detail Britain's plans for the defense of Singapore troop strengths in the region, and how the colonies would fight a potential war. The assessment is grim. Currently, Britain cannot win a fight with Japan. All 15 bags were forwarded to Tokyo, their reception causing a massive stir. The Strike South plan was not only feasible, it should begin soon. But wait, what of the American fleet at Pearl Harbor? If Japan took the Dutch East Indies, it would surely respond. Yet a group of naval officers felt otherwise arguing that the U.S. fleet could be preemptively destroyed at the commencement of hostilities, giving Japan a year or two to consolidate its wins in Southeast Asia before having to fight the Americans in earnest. It was worth developing a contingency plan. After all, in November, the British had used a fleet of carrier-launched torpedo bombers to raid an Italian port. Huh, they should get someone to study that possibility. Lucky for them, one man was eager for the assignment, Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto. Oh man, Zoe, can you imagine how all the public-facing stuff in this story was being reported in the news back then? I mean, it was probably being covered very differently in the United States than it was in Japan. At least today we have access to ground news. 
For the uninitiated, Ground News is a first-of-its-kind website and app that lets you compare how news stories are being covered across the political spectrum, which can be super helpful when you're trying to navigate conflicting information, sensationalized coverage, and endless social media feeds. That way you can be confident you're getting the whole story. Also, with their bias distribution chart, which I like to think of as a sort of metacritic for news biases, you get to see where various media outlets you get your news from falls on the political spectrum. Plus, you can even compare headlines to see how phrasing changes between news outlets, which not only is fascinating, but can actually help you find possible blind spots. Ooh, and speaking of blind spots, they even have a blind spot feed, displaying stories you might be interested in that are underrepresented in the news you regularly consume. So if you're looking for a better way to stay informed about current events around the world, check out Ground News by visiting ground.news slash extra credits to download their free app. Then, not only will you have more information about where your news is coming from, you'll also be helping out our channel in the process, which for the record is always news we like hearing. Thanks so much. Well, shucks howdy there, Ahmed Zia, Turk, Angelo Valenciana, Arcalite Games, Casey Mustia, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blame, and Skylar Holmes. Thanks so much for being legendary patrons.